It's time for the College of Ice with Brian Brosdahl and Steve Panaz. Hey guys, welcome to College of Ice. I hope you missed us on Wednesday night, but we are going to two nights a week starting now and running through the end of December because Ice season is almost here, and I'm, and I'm very excited about that. And we got a very cool show tonight. We got Kevin Van Dam coming in. You know him as a bass angler uh, extraordinaire. So I'm excited to have Kevin on board. We also have Chris Russell, who's the uh, marketing director for Plano Synergy, which owns Fraybill. And we're going to kind of talk about the effects of COVID is having on some of the uh, some of the tackle companies. And uh, so I'm excited. We got a great show on Wednesday coming up. It's uh, it should be a lot of fun. I'd also like to uh, congratulate Jamie Siegel last week for winning the Frabel prize pack for a $165 prize pack, uh, including the, the, the really cool College of Ice uh, mug, which is which is really fun. Hey, I'd like to bring in Brian Brosdahl. Uh, hey, bro. How you doing? Welcome to College of Ice, man. Yeah. Hey, hey, Jesse Quayle. Good to see you. Nice deer. Uh, glad to be here. We're so close. It's it's starting to happen in different areas like in Alberta, Canada and, and different areas. So, you know, we're right there. No, I know you're out today checking ice around your local waters. And hi, Jason. But, you know, talk about what did you find in northern Minnesota today in terms of ice? Uh, a lot of a lot of small lakes are froze over. The bigger lakes, anything over a thousand acres, uh, some of them are half uh open from the wind we've had just horrendous wind and of 20 30 mile an hour uh but at one spot i found uh four and a half five inches by shore and as soon as you got where it drops more than three feet two and a half inches and the average was about two inches by shore so it's not ready and there's still heat vents you know from the water coming up so be careful Hey, anybody that's uh, watching us tonight uh, please give us some ice reports from wherever you are to say hey Hey, Jeff, how are you? Uh, and Jesse, but really share with us what's happening locally um, I, and be careful out there. I know uh, Aaron, we went through the ice last week uh, in, in Manitoba and uh, it was a bad deal. So let's, it, it can happen to anybody. So let's just, let's just be uh, super careful. Jared. Bro, I just got back from Montana. I was out there uh, chasing some uh, mule deer out there for a few days. Temperatures in Mile City area were 40 during the day and 23 at night. So we started seeing ice build up and, and things. But even out there, there's not a lot of ice. And then driving across North Dakota, Bismarck and all that, yeah, yeah, bring your <laughs> bring your snipe. <laughs> but even the small lakes in North Dakota, they're not they're not frozen, they're not frozen over yet. And I know no. they're not safe. So uh, we got to be careful. And and I see you got your spikes, and I think that's a great idea. Absolutely. Uh, never, never take a chance. Like we said last time, if you bring all the gear, nothing will happen. Yeah. Hey, remind everybody that's uh, tuned in tonight. How can they win this prize pack? Tell us a little bit about the, the Frabel prize pack and, and how do they win? All you got to do is tune in, share the episode, drop us a question and comment during the show and you're in to win. You know, what's really cool tonight is Kevin Van Dam will be answering specific questions tonight. So if you have some questions for, uh, you have some questions for Kevin, send them in. And uh, I'd love to, uh, we're going to have a session with Kevin in here starting in about 10 minutes. So send those questions in and the best questions that we get, we'll, we'll run as many as we can uh, getting with Kevin. So that'd be kind of cool. And bro, later in the show, I think uh, we should open up the questions for you as well. And uh, let's have some fun uh, with that as well. So the more, the more questions they ask, the better your chance to win that prize pack, which is really cool. Hey, I, I had a question for you. I know you're a huge fan of live bait. I've been out there. Uh, Vikings game. I heard they just lost to a two and what, 17 <laughs> <laughs> Dallas. Darryl, oh, yeah. remind us. That's horrible. Hey, I can hear, oh, hey, you feel all the Packer fans going, woo, the Vikings lost again. Well, Anyway, hey, there we go. We got some stuff three and a half to six inches up in Devil's Lake. That's awesome. Thanks, hey, bro, take me through the types of live bait that you'd like to use in the winter. You know, start with, uh, you know, maggots, larva, and uh, that sort of thing. Well, maggots, uh, which is the blue bottle fly, are really tough. And the thing about them is they're smaller, too. So you can either use one if you want to go micro on a hook, or you can put a bunch on. And, and they work even on a spoon if you're going to fish for bigger perch or walleyes. But 
Waxies, on the other hand, that's a bee moth. In uh, we got a, a picture we can show here of the waxies. Um, waxies are messy. I mean, when you hook them, they're real soft, and when, and when you shake them in the water, they make a mess, and it draws in fish from a distance. And you put on two or three waxies, T-bone them, and sometimes you just hook them a couple times, break the tip. And kind of squeeze the guts out. It sounds terrible, but it's fishing. Come on, that's just how it is. And, and you know they they work really well, and they draw fish in from a distance. Butter worms. I don't know if they taste like butter, but let me tell you, they're uh, the Chilean moth. We don't have too many of those around here, but they got really cool colors, and they work really well. And they're super durable. A little bit more durables. Mousies. I I haven't heard the, the term mousy in years, and they used to be very popular probably 20, 25 years ago. That's pretty incredible. No, it, it is. And that, that little tail kind of reminds me like a blood worm or something like that. And they're a drone fly. And, you know, it, bait shops carry stuff as long as they sell it. If it doesn't sell, they're not going to carry it. So when you go in there, make sure you buy a lot of stuff. Mealworms. People know mealworms because you can get them at a pet shop to feed uh, lizards and animals and stuff. But mealworms... I don't use those as often, but they work just fine. And uh, red wagglers are probably pretty high on my list right now. The red worms, uh, you'll see these when you fish near the backwaters of the Mississippi, La Crosse, Wisconsin, that stuff. Did I just give away someone's secret? I hope not. But anyway, <laughs> you know, you put a night crawler in a hook, a night crawler is bigger, a chunk of night crawler is bigger than the ice lures that we're using, a mud bug or gill getter. Uh, so the red wagglers, it's like a night crawler, but finessey and dainty. Hey, Kai, go back to the shot of the uh, larva, the maggot. Bro, I want to talk to you a little bit about these. Where do you actually, where do you like to hook these and how do you typically hook them? Well, I, I like to go into the, the, the square end and without ex making them explode because they're really, their skin is tough. You, you just strike through the, the tip and bring the hook through. And sometimes if it's really tough, I'll take that hook and I'll, I'll just kind of go through and you just want to go through the end, but sometimes I'll thread them. If you're using micro stuff, if I'm using a size 12 or 14 gill getter, I could thread it on and then add a second one. Uh, but the body of the bait covers the hook and remember the thing with hooks, you don't want to leave your point uncovered <clears throat> in color. I always order them in red and, uh, I want to give a little shout out to, to Vado's Express out there because I, I have been ordering from them for many, many years. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's just a great color. Hello, well, everybody. To answer Jim's question, though, they, they, they get the different colors of the larva by whatever they feed the, the, the bait. And yeah. uh, that's how they get the different colors. Yeah, and they're feeding them uh, food coloring, you know, when they're e eating the rotten meat. And, uh, you know, it, it – Everybody tries different things, and I know red's really popular because bloodworms are red, but they're not always red. You know, sometimes bloodworms are translucent white, sometimes, and bloodworms are a big part of a, a diet of all of our fish in all of our lakes. And so uh, multiple colors, it's up to you. I like white. I, I use it a lot, but, you know, I'm also a big fan of soft plastics and soft baits like gulp. When do you use soft plastics, and when do you go to uh, live bait? Well. There's in the lakes that I fish, and it, it's like this everywhere in the Midwest. Bloodworms are important, so I designed a bloodworms for Northland tackle many years ago, over 15 years ago. The original bloodworm is still on the shelves today, and I've cut a lot of fish on it. it. It's a silhouette; it looks like what the fish are eating. Now, skeleton minnow kind of is the advanced version of the bloodworm, and it, it works really, really good. Uh, it, we call it skeleton minnow because bloodworm was already taken. And then do I do a great question, Michelle? Actually, I, what I do is I'll, I'll just, I'll put a body of a wax worm on a, on a, on a mud bug or a gill getter, and then I'll add plastic at the tip. So the fish have to inhale it to get to the meat. Great question. That is a great question. So when, uh, do you fish soft plastics any differently than live bait? Well, I stay above the fish and in dark water, you silhouette and use darker colors. Um, I always have plastics on in, in a lot of lakes up here. It's 50, 50. There's a lot of lakes. You won't catch anything with bait. You'll only catch them on a skeleton minnow or a blood worm. And I could have a bunch of people out there and I've had tournament anglers from all over the place and they come, they come in and they want to beat me with their techniques. 
and I'm just sitting there and I'm, I'm just barely moving that blood worm and I'm catching slab crappies and really big perch. And it, it depends on where you're at and it's different everywhere. Wow. Bro, we're getting a lot of really awesome comments. Hey, I, I, I know uh, Fraybill actually has a Black Friday special. I can't believe Thanksgiving's coming up this week, but there's going to be a lot of specials. But there's a really cool deal on the i3 suit. Uh, cool. I know you're a fan of it right there. But yeah, this the is best. This suit right here for running around on the ice, drilling holes, and it's it's warm, but you're not going to sweat real bad in it. It's just a great run around, and it's one of my favorite suits. But if you buy the top, you get the bibs 50% off. That's after the show starting tomorrow, which is midnight tonight. So remember, if, you, if you're if you looking for a suit, check it out and, and you know think of somebody for Christmas right now. So this is at freebill.com. And again, as bro mentions, it starts tomorrow. Uh, actually, tonight at midnight, if you're up uh, and, and go there. There's also specials on other ice fishing gear. But hey, uh, later on Wednesday, we've got a really cool show. We're going to talk about new products uh, or great gift ideas for the ice angler and people's uh, families. So I'm looking forward to that show as well. Oh, absolutely. Looking forward to it. And thanks, uh, Wally's Unlimited there. Yeah, abso absolutely. absolutely. No, this is not a, a float suit, but it is a uh, well-engineered and uh, comfortable suit. Well, and it has self-rescue because it comes with uh, a pair of retractable uh, picks, the Frables, and you could take them and put them on the bottom. So yeah. uh, great. Thanks. That's a thanks, uh, Robert. Hey, by the way, I, I can't recommend highly enough having picks with you at all times, uh, bro. You've been through the ice. I've been through the ice. Without picks, it's very hard to get out. Uh, absolutely, very hard to get out. Well, we, we don't. We have fingernails like humans, not like animals. If we had claws, <laughs> you could scratch your way out. You go through. You ain't gonna. You got to have something that you could really stab in the ice in. I never go without these and I never take any risks. If I think that when I'm going out, I'm drilling ahead, I'm chiseling ahead and it's, it's a, uh, you have people with you. So, yeah. it's, you know, and, and bring rope and, and everything. Greg. That's awesome. It, yeah. Hey, uh, we've got a very special guest in the lobby right now. You guys know Kevin Van Dam. KVD has been, one of the top tournament anglers for years. He's won four Bass Master Classics. He's qualified for the Classic for 28 times. I mean, uh, we've seen this picture a lot. It's just an exciting angler. He's 25 wins on the Bass Master Circuit, and now he's fishing Major League. But, uh, Kevin, uh, welcome to College of Ice. Thanks for joining us. You bet, guys. It's there he is. pretty exciting. I watched the show last week, and I was fascinated, man. I'm, I'm learning a lot. I, I love to ice fish. And, um, you know, a lot of the times I only get to fish the, the first ice because the tour season starts. So hopefully we get some early ice this year. So what is your favorite species of fish on ice? You, you know, what? I spend most of my time uh, bluegill fishing. And, you know, I, I'm in southwest Michigan. <laughs> um, there's nothing like a, a winter Michigan bluegill. You know, it, I love We love to eat them, too. But they're tricky, you know. And so, I, like I said, I'm fascinated Last week I was listening. I've never thought of, you know, when fluorocarbon came out, I thought it was the only way to go. And, you know, we get some fussy lakes that get a lot of pressure and, you know, slowing your jig down. I mean, when they came out with tungsten jigs, I said, man, that's the only way to go. But, um, you know, it made me think a little bit, you know, when you guys got to talking about about my weights and line size and, you know, I, we're, we're not not I am not the best ice fishermen but i've got a couple of buddies that are really serious about it and um, we get real competitive when we get there on the ice just like a bass tournament you know so who's catching the most and who can figure it out so i got a few tricks to, to throw at them this year what so pound Kevin, do you use for bluegills you know i i like two i use two pound fluorocarbon and um i just i don't want to break off much i've tried lighter but i i've I found it to be, to be uh, real good. And then the biggest thing that I've seen is tungsten jigs are, you know, it, it's just great to be able to get down. We do a lot of lakes that are real clear since the zebra mussels got in here. So yeah. a lot of the fishing that, um, and, I mean, we got some lakes where you can catch them in 10, 12 foot of water, but honestly it's 25 foot, that 20 oh. to 30 foot zone. Yeah. Where we spend a lot of time and without tungsten, it's, it's tough. 
That's yep. amazing. So Kevin, you've really excelled at building patterns. I mean, especially on the bass circuit, you seem to be able to go to a ramp or a lake and figure things out. What is your process for building a pattern in open water? Now we'll bring it into ice, but take us kind of, do you have any secrets on really building patterns? Well, you know, I mean, the big thing when you're bass fishing all over the country is you've got to follow the seasonal patterns and ice fishing is the same. I mean, the fish migrate, um, uh, you know, throughout different times of year. I mean, first ice is very different than it is in, in January compared to the, you know, the end of the season and, you know, where the, where the fish have. And I mean, you guys uh, know that, but a lot of, um, you know, just casual ice fishermen, they, they really don't understand that. The biggest thing for me that has changed the way that I fish is electronics. You know, I mean, I've got a, a Hummingbird uh, Ice Helix 7 and with Lake Master mapping, it's it's a game. I if if my battery was dead or something, I'll just go home. I will I will not fish without it. There's two things I won't go fishing without. These right here, <laughs> and, and my ice helix. I mean, those are two of the greatest innovations for ice fishing. Um, you know, I mean, there's been so much technology that's improved it. Um, you know, I, I'm I kind of get to see a lot of it. My brother has a sporting goods store here in Kalamazoo at DNR. I know Brian, you've been there before. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, nice they place. do a big ice show and it, you know, it's, it's, it's huge. You know I mean? Just the advancements in our clothing, just like you were showing the the new uh, Frey Bell suits and stuff, our, our gloves, our, our clothes, the augers, electronics has been a, a huge one, but also, you know, fluorocarbon, the tungsten jigs, uh, but you still go back to the basics, you know, the wax worms and that. I mean, mousies are the only way to roll. If you can get mousies, <laughs> <laughs> where are you finding them? Because I haven't seen them for two decades. Well, we've got a couple of uh, local uh, bait distributors around here that, it, it, I mean, it's challenging. It, they're, they're hit or miss. And the, the smart guys, they get them early and they yeah. buy them all up because you can keep them in the fridge for a while and, um, you know, you can get spikes and you can get red spikes all the time anywhere. You can get wax worms all the time. And, and wax worms are still my go to. But um, if you can get mousies that and and true, I mean, real wigglers, not not red worms, yeah. but, but yeah. wigglers, those are hard to beat. You know? Oh, the mayfly larva. Yeah. So yeah. It's funny, we're, we're talking about ice fishing, but my dad is a he is a huge bluegill fisherman. He's 82 years old. We've got a, a, a really good lake that he lives on that's got giant gills. And he he's still, I mean, he was fishing yesterday. So we've just, we've had this crazy fall and, and had these nice days. So if he gets a nice calm day, he's still out there. But he's basically fishing in a boat with, you know, and it's the same thing. You know, we're running, um, you know, Lake Master mapping and, and we've got the lake, our lake mapped out. And, you know, and you're just following the, the down imaging and just moving around real slow, looking for them. And that's the way that I ice fish, too. You know, you say one of the biggest things um, it's I'm out there just like I'm covering water during the summer. That's what I do. Ice fishing. I'm I'm going to drill a ton of holes. You better have a lot of batteries for your drill because I'm going to I'm going to burn through a bunch of them. And we do the same thing. Bluegill fishing is, you know, it put a put a four inch auger out there so you're you know you can get a lot more of them and if you you know if you're catching giant ones th there's not many that won't fit through a four inch hole even so but or five inch you might have to go to but i'm going to burn a bunch of holes and uh and just start checking it i mean just i don't even drop until i see them i don't even i don't even drop down and fish and once you can find an area you can zoom in and the, the thing that's cool is from year to year these fish are, you know, they'll use the same areas around the same time frame. So, you know, in December, it's different than it is in January. But on our lakes where we fish, um, you will find them in these same basins or on the same little weed corners. And that's where the mapping comes in is um, you can do that. So I, I'm really excited to try to, um, and I'm sure, Brian, you are the same, yeah. to, to rig the 360 mega up so I can start drop that down and and look around the holes. I, I, I got it ready and uh, it's it's all set and ready to go and I got two lithium batteries uh, so and it's a small it's a, it's a smaller package uh, and it it's it's gonna be nice not have to turn it or look around. And I was gonna ask you when do you get ice in Michigan? I would. So you know the last couple of years it's it's down in the southern part of the state where I'm at. Um, it's usually not till around January, you know, oh, I mean, okay. we'll get it in January last year. Um, it, it warmed up. I mean, it was cold in December 
and we really didn't uh, we didn't have good ice. I mean, you could fish some of the smaller lakes and that, but I'm not I'm not risking it. You know, no. I, I like to have no. you know four inches of good ice before I'm I'm gonna go. And and fortunately, I have some really good friends. You know, I got a good network, and that's I think every ice fisherman's that way. Oh you yeah, work of buddies, and you can kind of figure out what's going on. And then my brother's store. You know, at DNR. Um, you know, the, those guys, uh, you know, guys are coming in buying bait. So they're always getting good intel on where they're safe ice and, and, you know, where the fish are biting, you know, if it's perch or crappie or, um, and, and I do, I love to fish for bass through the ice, but it's, it's mainly, you know, early season, I'll go jig bass for, you know, a few days. It's, it's fun to do. Cause they're, I've learned so much that I've applied to my, you know, job as a professional fisherman about the myths of what fish do in cold water and it blows people away if i post a picture on social media standing on the ice with a bass they're like i how how could you would you even you know imagine to get one to bite but you know they're they're still very aggressive i'm amazed how aggressive they could be um especially at first ice especially on a tip up chase a baits of and and think and things like that so it's taught me that i can use a lot more aggressive techniques than i than i thought i could in really cold water and in tough situations that I face all over the country. Kevin, we're going to run a few questions by you when you get a chance yeah. from uh, some of the viewers tonight. But if we go back to pattern building again, is there a, is there a one or two things you'd recommend for helping people go from not catching a fish to putting that first fish on the ice or in the boat and then fine tuning that pattern to be able to really kind of put them, you know, solid, a solid fishing pattern together. Yeah. The, you know, the thing that I can tell you is the best bass fishermen that I've ever been around, they're super, super observant. So when you get that first bite, you know, look at your map, look at, you know, look around. I mean, how high was he off the bottom? How did, you know, you know, there's, you want to look at every single detail that happened when you came in contact with that first fish, or even if you're marking them and not catching them, how, you know, how they're acting. And it's just crazy how from one day to the next, They'll be right on the bottom or sometimes, you know, before I had electronics, we always just fish down there, you know, close to the bottom. But I mean, I've seen times where they're 10 feet off the bottom, you know, when they're out there. And so um, a lot of it has to do with the weather. And I'm a just a huge, I think every fisherman is a weather fanatic. So I pay real close attention to it. I've got all the different apps on my phone. So, you know, just, just be aware when you come in contact with that first fish or you catch that first one every possible thing that that you can uh you know put into your memory bank because chances are that, i mean there's fish are there for a reason it, there, there's no such thing as a fluke and uh, you know you, you don't get lucky uh you know to be consistent in, in catching them so you just really got to be observant and pay attention to all the little details and, and the and uh you know everything around you the hard thing through the ice is you can't always see the water clarity. You can't see some of the other conditions that you can when you're out in a in, in a boat. But I, you know, I think a, a lot of the guys understand the lakes that they're in, or or you know, they're using uh, you know cameras and things like that too, where you actually can. So that was you know, you guys are asking me questions, but I had some you know, I had some questions. <laughs> I was like for Brian, like how do you know what? what color jig you want to start with, you know, based on the water clarity, our, our lakes are clear, clear, but yeah. I mean, it's crazy how like one day it's, you know, chartreuse is hard to beat. And then, you know, then it's orange or it's or you got to use just gold or, um, I agree. you know, I don't, I, I, that's the thing. I've got a box full and, you know, bass fishing, it's batch the hatch and be, you know, be natural and real clear water and bluegills and perch. Um, it's, it's really, that's not the case. I think I think a lot of times it's just getting something that they can see, you know, or, or a glow, you know I mean? Do you, when do you use glow or not? So there's a, that's the things that I, uh, uh, you know, I'm avid, but I, I'm not, I'm not like you where you're fishing, you know, well, and I'm using stuff like this. That I, don't, I don't know if you can see it, but there's a light stick in this little small, yeah. but now that treble hook's too big for a bluegill. So I'll just put a little line down there to a little jig and yeah. take the treble off. And it's amazing that the bluegills go to these light stick technology baits like this buckshot rattlespoon. They swim right up to it. And especially in darker water, just like perch, they don't have the best vision. Though I catch them after dark sometimes, 
but color to me, you can't beat anything that has a little bit of a glow red to it, but really clear lakes that have a lot of weeds, uh, chartreuse and uh, green and, uh, and then gold is always a big bluegill getter. I, I think any big fish, old fish don't have the best eyes, just like humans. And <laughs> So we have to get a spotlight out for them. But I was going to ask you, have you ever ice fished in Minnesota or anywhere else outside of Michigan? I I really, I haven't. Um, I've fished all over Michigan, you know, from it, really the the whole lower peninsula, uh, you know, and I've fished for pike and walleyes and, you know, I've done a lot of tip up fishing and things like that too. But I mean, my, my main go-to is, is around my house where I live in Southwest Michigan Sure. And it's primarily bluegill fishing. There's a lot. I mean, we're blessed with a, a ton of water and a lot of these little uh, pothole lakes. You know, there's a lot of them you can't get on in the summer. Yeah. You know, they're private. But during the winter, you can access them. And, and that's where some of the best fishing is. Yeah, from Cold Spring to uh, Brooklyn, Michigan, there is a lot of water. And I've, I've spent time and I've seen you at the shows when I've been out there. And, yeah, you do have quite a quite a bunch of lakes there, especially towards Brooklyn too. There's quite a few. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I know you fished that tournament over there. I've got all my buddies. They've done, they've done well. They haven't won that thing yet, but um, they always consistently do well. The challenge is, is always getting those big crappies, you know? Yeah. That, that's that. We don't target crappie on a day to day basis. So that's a new, uh, that's a new frontier. And, and the plastics are, seem to be the key for the crappie. Absolutely. Yeah. Those wigglers, like in one tournament, uh, the winners actually laid the wiggler with a micro gamma katsu hook right on a plant and, and it picked it off the plant and that's getting really intricate. Yeah. Yeah. They're, these, they're pretty serious about it. I mean, the, the, the hard thing for us is the mobility because most of these lakes you can't, we don't, you know, especially early days, you can't run, um, you know, a, a four wheeler or anything out there. You've got to walk yourself out there. You've got to, you know, have a sled Put your put your gear in, and of course yeah. we're tech junkies, so we've got it. You know, you got it all. Like you say, I mean, you're going to be pulling. Sure. I've got lithiums in my bass boat, and it's the same thing. You would never run the Mega 360 out there um, all day on the ice without without the power of lithium batteries. And you know, even though they're only 27 pounds a piece, it's still you know it all adds up when you when you start lugging everything out <laughs> there, dragging it. It's a whole lot nicer if you could. Uh, pull it out there, you know, on a, a snowmobile or something like that. But we just really don't have that option very often here. Hey, Kevin, we got some uh, questions from viewers tonight. We got one up on the screen right now. Uh, yeah. Smallies or largemouth, what's your favorite? I, I, try, you know, I fish for both, but um, smallmouth are real nomadic, even through the ice. You know, largemouth are real predictable. Uh, you know, early season, you're going to find those, those fish. Um, Inside turns on the weed lines, they're going to be right on that weed edge. You know, the mouth of a bay, um, a, a hole in a big flat, things like that. They just, they love those areas and they'll really congregate. That's why I like to bass fish um, through the ice early like that is because you can go out there and just really find a, a huge congregation of fish in a small area. And smallmouth are, you know, it, they're just not like that. You know, they're, they're still, I've caught smallmouth through the ice in four foot of water up on sand flats, the same place as they were, you know, in the fall. It's, it's mm -hmm. crazy. You know I mean? Um, you, there's this myth that, you know, the bass go deep when it's cold or, you know, they, they just, you know, are real sluggish and, and that's not the case. I mean, no. I get large mouth jigging through the ice first ice. A lot of times four or five foot of water in the edge of the lily pads that were there, you know? So it's, uh, it, it's, it's very rare, but I mean, if you can find, one of those lakes that is, is a pretty shallow lake and it has one structural element or one hole in it or, you know, a major uh, point on a flat that has a one turn on it. That's that's where they'll really get congregated. And you might be able to catch 100 in, in one little 20 yard stretch. Oh, yeah. So Kendra Michelle asked, do you like inline reels? Um, you know what? I still I like a spinning reel. You know, I'm using just a, a real small spinning reel. And it's, again, a big part of, of that is it's what I've kind of gotten used to in starting to fish some of these lakes where one day I'm fishing, you know, 10 feet. And then the next day I might be, I'm, we're fishing 30. You know, a lot of the bluegill fishing we do is truly in that, that 25 foot range. It seems like the magic number, you know, within a few feet of that. And, and I think that has to do with the, uh, some of these deep 
uh, grass flats on these lakes where the light penetration zone is at. And that that's a real key thing, um, I think, for bluegill fishing is based on the water clarity in the lake that those those bluegills like to hang where that, you know, just beyond where that brighter light penetration zone is at. You know, they're just deeper than that. It's just like bass in the summer. Yeah. Um, you know, if you can see the bottom in 20 foot, you know, there's a good chance that probably 30 foot is going to be the, the zone that they're really going to, be, you know, going to be a lot of those summertime fishing. And it's kind of the same in the winter. You know, they're going to be where the food's at for sure. But um, I think the, the water clarity and the light penetration is a big factor in, in how, the, how the fish set up through the ice. Absolutely. And you know, the thicker the ice and the snow, it's going to change that. So, Kevin, typically how thick is the ice in January in the lakes that you're fishing? You know, it's, it's, it'll start, like, I don't like to go, if you get three inches of good, hard, you know, solid ice, I'll, I'll fish on that. My wife is, she's adamant about me being super safe. We don't, I don't go, I no. just don't take risks with it. You know, we always go in a group and just like you were talking about, you know, we carry a rope, we got all our safety equipment and things like that at, at the early ice. And you never know, cause I mean, there's springs in a lot of these lakes and stuff. So yeah. even if you got good ice, you can find a, a bad spot out there or if you get a little warm up or things like that. But, you know, the, the thickest ice that we typically get down here, maybe two feet on a really, really one of those super. Oh, oh wow. OK. So most of the time we don't ever have to use an extension on an auger. I mean, that, that that's <laughs> something that is uh, it, it's not a lot of fun. Yeah. Oh. Hey, uh, Joseph Allen has asked a question. He says, do weather patterns affect winter fishing as it does in summer fishing? Absolutely. One thousand um, percent. The fish. It's amazing how um, the time of the day matters and, and the weather, you know, just like summertime, you get, uh, you know, a, a frontal path, you know, a front coming in and low pressure and that. I mean, they, those fish get real active. They'll get high off the bottom. Um, they'll get real aggressive. You can be real aggressive with the way that you jig your your bait. And then, you know, you get those high, bright days. You go out there at noon on a high, bright post frontal day with no wind and, and see how many bites you get. You know, at yeah. four in the afternoon, an hour before dark, then, you know, they'll move up towards the weed edge and you can, you can wear them out. I mean, but um, you know, you get those, those, you know, same type of weather days that make for good bass fishing, you know, largemouth fishing in the, you know, summertime. Those are great days to ice fish where you can catch them all day. True. And then a Dave Rupp asks, how long do you fish a spot before you move? And kind of go into yeah, detail on that. 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 Well, I'm on the move. I mean, I am, I just, if I'm not seeing them on my depth finder and, and that's the thing that's kind of a fault for me, I've got some buddies that are, they're really good ice fishermen. And once they find an area and they start catching them, they'll sit there and work a hole and try to draw the fish to their bait. I just, I like to keep moving. So, I mean, if I've got enough holes drilled, I'm just going to keep going. Um, if I'm not catching them, I'm on the move. It's, it's like, you know, it's just like during the summer, I'm going to have that trolling motor on high and that's, I'm just, I'm walking, moving, dropping that puck in the hole and, and trying to, trying to find a fish that I, that I, I want to know that one's looking at my bait. If you don't see them, you don't fish it, do you? I, I just, I prefer not to, I mean, yeah. uh, you know, I'm not going to, I definitely don't drop down there. Um, if I don't see one, if I drop down and the fish swims away, I may sit there and jig it for a minute and try to get them to come back. I mean, when they're biting, um, I'm, I'm really, really dangerous when it starts getting a little bit tougher. That's where being impatient like me, you know, doesn't necessarily always pay off. And I got a couple of buddies that'll, you know, they, they're just a little more patient and, and, they'll make it work, you know, especially if you get a hot hole or, you you know, they're just keying on a certain depth zone or, or, you know, spot where they'll just, you know, you wait them out. I, I have a hard time waiting them out. They put an anchor down, right? I can't do that. I'm not spot locked. No. Hey, hey, I got a kick out of this question. Uh, I'm supposed to challenge you to be on Lake Commandos. <laughs> oh boy. I'll go anytime, man. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, I had a chance to go head to head with Bro this uh, fall. It was, a, it was a lot of fun, so it was kind of cool. Bro, I know you have some questions for Kevin as well. Yeah, you know, I, I know that uh, you, you've been out in fishing. What is your your target fish? Uh, you know, is it the same as bluegills, late ice as early ice? And, and outside of that, what's your favorite eating fish? Well, I think that, um, you know, bluegills are, are pretty hard to beat all the time. The only thing I think better than a bluegill is a yellow perch. Um, sure. 
you know, I, I like perch fishing too. I, I, I like the, uh, the challenge of it. And when I say perch fishing, I'm, I'm not going to these world-class fisheries like St. Clair, Saginaw Bay, or, or, sure. um, you know, I've got a couple of buddies that are, that fish Grand Traverse Bay if it, if it ever freezes. And it, it, it's unbelievable. Some of the perch that you can get when they get ice up there, giants. Um, but we fish them in these inland lakes around where I live and they're a total different animal. I mean, they're not where the bluegills are at typically. Um, you know, they're, they're more bottom huggers in these inland natural lakes that are real soft bottom like that. And so you, you kind of got to, um, target them and, and cover a lot of water. And what I've learned is that, you know, those spoons, like that spoon you were just showing, yeah. we, we'll run those, um, with a, with a little, hook beneath it with a bait but just so i can get down real fast and cover a lot of water and, and i love that yeah yeah you, you know i love that and you catch we catch a lot of bluegill with that too you know you know doing that that's something i never would have thought and i learned that fishing for perch that those spoons can be deadly effective for bluegill too i mean they're they're really attractive uh you know they're cur they're very curious but once you get one close to it that's when you just got to slow it down and really almost hold it still. And they'll come up there and, and, you know, eat the, the mousey or the wax worm off the, off the hook beneath that spoon, but you get them interested by jigging it fast. But so, I mean, that's what I prefer to do, but we've got a few lakes that got some good pike in them too. So I'll, you know, we'll, I, I love, it's kind of fun to run tip ups every now and then. And flowages over there. What now? Some of the big flowages that you have. No, we do them in, in a lot of these natural lakes. To mm -hmm. that, that ha we have some um, that have yeah. You know, there's one lake real close to me called Gull Lake that has uh, a smelt population, natural smelt population mm -hmm. in it, and it it gets it grows some really giant ones, and they're real pelagic. They run open water, and, and it's I haven't got to fish there in years just because of the it's it it's one of the last lakes to freeze up here but it's got some really good pike in it and uh it's, it's kind of fun to be able to tip up fish that awesome yeah. kevin are you getting bass on tip ups at all you know occasionally but typically with the way we set for pike we'll, we'll run um the either dead bait high or you know a live sucker and run it real high and you don't if you want to catch a bass on tip ups you got to run something down closer to the bottom and use smaller baits and you know we're we're just we're always looking trying to look for big ones. So I'm using big baits and I'm usually running them pretty high. Yeah. Shiners are incredible. And it, and it's, it shocks me how aggressive bass can be on the shiners. It, it just is amazing. Hey, uh, if you got time for one more question, uh, we really yeah. appreciate you coming on tonight. We really do. Thank um, you. Kai, what was that question that was just up before this one? Do you eat bass? <laughs> that was the <laughs> <that> one. <laughs> Somebody asked I, if you like I, I you know, early when I was growing up, I filleted a lot of them. I just, um, you know, I don't blame people for doing it. If you're going to, you know, eat the eat the small ones, the little one and two pounders, you know, the, the keepers. But I don't. I just uh, the only the only ones that I've ate in recent years are from my pond. And that's just because I need to keep some of the numbers down, you know, in it like that. So we'll, I'll, uh, I'll catch some like that. And that the best time to do it is through the ice for sure. But, uh, I'm not a big, uh, I, I love bluegill or fruit <laughs> and or wildlife, you know, whatever it is, but, uh, yeah. it's just hard to, hard to kill one when you make your living off them. Yeah. Kevin, uh, I know you're instrumental in the development of the edge series of boxes. Uh, I mean, sitting in the product development meetings with you as, uh, you know, with the rust proofing and everything, uh, do you have a couple favorite models and what do you like about the box? Well, so to me, this is going to be your own already. Yeah. one of my new favorites. This is the, the new 3500 series. Um, what I like about the edge series is everything, but you know, the, the one handed latch is a big deal, but you know, if you want to have a really good terminal box, having these, all these little, um, you know, all these little terminal pieces that you have. This is the 3600. I'm going to, my new ice box is going to be the 3500 series that I just ordered all of these compartments individually. And that's the, that's the neat thing now is that you can go online and, and just get those. Or there's some retailers are carrying them too, but you know, having those closable, um, you know, uh, compartments 
So when you got your tungsten, so I can keep, that's the hard thing for me is, is keeping the sizes separately. I always used to use a fly box, just a little plain old fly box. Yeah. Rice jigs. But now I can, I can put them by exact weight. And so it doesn't matter what color. I, I know what color I can see through the clear lid, but having the, you know, keeping those weights separated. So I know, um, and then label them will be a big deal. So I'm going to rig a, one of these up, but even for a, a great bass, you know, specialty box, you know, if you want to do a, just a, a, a Nico rig box, you know, you take a 3,500 and put the weights and just the things you need in that, and you can label it just for that. Um, you know, I, I love the, uh, the 3,700 series, but having the option now that we have some of these other smaller sizes and uh, it's just, they just taken um, utility boxes to the next level. I mean, these are exponentially the best boxes I've ever had. I mean, uh, my my favorite in the whole line is the bladed jig box. It just it just me too. Yeah, store them. Yeah, and that that edge bladed jig jig box, and it's great for jigs too. But bladed jigs are so hard to store. So that's probably my all time favorite. But um, I mean, they're all great. The spinner bait box. I'm a huge spinner bait guy. Um, it's just so easy having the compartments, you know, move, you just put them, you know, lay them in there. It's just, uh, just having the lids being crystal clear is, is a huge advantage and, you know, having restrictor and, and just, you know, having the water, waterproof seal, all that makes a difference. But those are things you don't think of. I mean, I don't even think about my stuff getting rusty anymore. It's, I've changed everything over and, uh, the, the, the flex box is probably going to be the foundation for all my hard baits because I can make it anything I want. You know, I mean, if you have not seen the new Edge Flex series, it's it awesome. is, you know, it's the greatest innovation in utility storage ever, I think. I mean, it's what we've always wanted to have, the infinite box. And that's what it is. You can, you can infinitely put all the storage compartments to make it whatever you want. If you want to make it so you got one big compartment to put a spool line for leader line in your drop shot box, you can do that. So um i i just uh i just ordered 24 of those flex uh 3700s just wow because i for for crankbaits and you know all your hard baits i can make it exactly fit the the size and the type of bait you know perfectly so that's that'll be uh a, a big part of my tackle system in in my bass boat awesome Kevin, thanks so much for your time tonight. We really appreciate you coming on board. I, I didn't expect us to run uh, almost 20 minutes with you, almost 25 yeah. minutes, but thank you so much. And uh, Hi. have a great Thanksgiving. We'll okay. see you later. Thanks Good for joining advice. us. Thanks. Advice. Good luck on the ice. Yeah. Bye, guys. Bro, isn't that amazing? Kevin Van Dam, 25 minutes with that guy. Isn't that cool? And he ice fishes. That's the best part. Well, well he's... I, you, you can see his competitive fire. I mean, uh, just the mention of Lake Commandos at uh, any time. <laughs> that, was kind of, that was kind of fun. Hey, we got some new products. We do want to talk about some hot new products. Uh, take it away on, on uh, I know you, uh, I know you're a fan of Razor Augers. Oh, I love them. Great company. And they, they have a lot of different size augers, um, you know, four, five, six, seven, and eight inch bits even 10 inch but on the scouts which you use on a on a drill you know your yeah. drill you have in your garage um it's it's nice to be able to drill small holes find yeah. the and then drill a bigger hole and the 40 volt and the uh, 24 volt and there's a 24 yeah oh well, there's a picture of it here i i have been a fan for, i've been using this product for a year now and it's actually been amazing but one of the things i want to talk about is it does come in two different blade styles you've got the curved blades, which I really like for cutting new holes, especially on, you know, pure ice and clean ice. And mm -hmm. then you've got a chipper style uh, as well. And, and this is a great one for reopening old holes or in, in the case where you fish an area that has a lot of pressure and you're, you're drilling a new hole, but you're cutting through debris on the ice or, or something else. It's really a, a, a great blade for that kind of stuff. In the, in the prairie lakes, you get in the Dakotas sometimes, you, you should have both because you, you don't know uh, what kind of heavy winds are blowing dirt out onto the ice, and it's nice to have that chipper blade. It's 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 going to get you through, and uh, there's been, I've had a lot of dull augers uh, out on, in areas that there, no one's been fishing out there, and uh, especially in high traffic areas, it's just good to have extra blades with you at all times, especially if you're, if you're driving a little bit. But uh, 
I've had no problem drilling old holes with the, the curved blades, but you know, the chipper style is better and that's going to be your house renters and uh, people who have uh, stuff out there uh, with uh, thick ice. And then you're in a fish house. You, you, you can't have a, you don't want it to be too aggressive. You want to just chip away at it as it's going down. Yeah. Hey, uh, I, we've got to move on here. We got Chris Russell, marketing director for Plano Synergy right. fishing and hunting. Uh, Chris, uh, thanks for waiting for us. I'm sorry. We're a little bit slow Great. tonight. How are you? Hey, I'm good. I'm good. I had a great time listening to you guys talking to Kevin. You could have spent the whole rest of the time doing that. I would have been fine. Wow. Hey, you shaved. I did. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were I knew I was going to be uh, live tonight. I had to shave up. <laughs> so, hey, uh, you're down in Charleston, South Carolina right now, which is God's country if you love red fishing and uh, beautiful beaches and things like that. But you're also a fan of ice fishing. I am. Yes, yes. I lived in uh, Denver for a number of years and uh, learned to ice fish there for uh, lake trout. Actually, that was our target species. Uh, and then I've been a few times up in Minnesota with you guys. Uh, you know, bro, you and I got to run around on the ice a couple times. I've been up uh, near the Canadian border a few times. So I love it. Um, I, I like fishing with flip flops on a lot. I got to tell you. It's, <laughs> yeah. It's, it's a little different, oh, but I love ice fishing too. So, Hey, bro, I got a couple of photos of Chris I got to share with you. Look at that. Uh, awesome. Where did you catch? Where did you catch the soccer? It must have been Lake of the Woods. It was, yeah, yeah, Artisans. We were at Artisans uh, last year, actually. So and uh, and a walleye as well. Yep, we did. Yep, yep. We had a good time. That was uh, uh, doing a little product testing for Frayville, and uh, I was with the whole Frayville team that trip. Oh, that's very cool. That's awesome. Hey, COVID has really changed uh, ice fishing and uh, the fishing market tremendously. Uh, the St. Paul Ice Show was canceled, and I know other ice shows have been canceled. So if I was in your position, how do you get the word out to people about all the awesome new products and the new stuff that Frable's offering? Uh, you know, Steve, three words, really. College of ice. <laughs> is what it goes with. So, um, no, we, uh, you know, it's, it is really challenging. You know, we, we've got uh, uh, a different way of thinking about it. Bro, you and I started talking about this concept in July right? Yeah. Um, we, we knew things were changing. ICAST had completely changed. Shows were already canceling. There was concern about what might happen yeah. during the winter months. And so Bro and I got on the phone and we said, man, we love the Bro Roadshow and we love you traveling all over, but we're not comfortable sending you to 30 stops. And, and, I, and he was not comfortable doing it either. We just didn't know. So um, reaching out to uh, anglers digitally, electronically is, is definitely uh, the, the course of the day. The good news, Steve, though, is all these new anglers coming into our sport. You know, people now are trying fishing or they're coming back to that. And so um, the challenge is also reaching those folks that maybe don't tune in to a lot of normal fishing programming or don't read magazines. They're just learning a lot. So that's been a big challenge. And, and we're working on new ways to do that this spring and this winter as well. What's really been exciting to me on College of Ice is just seeing all the comments. I mean, we're seeing them from Vermont and New York and all the way across the ice belt. And I, the excitement is is at a fever pitch to get out. I think COVID's got people in their houses and they're just waiting for that ice to get safe to get out. And I think that's pretty cool that uh, we get to share that excitement and then have a forum like this where they can access top anglers to get questions answered, which is really cool, I think, as well. Yeah, I, I learned a bunch listening to the, the you two and then Kevin talking about bluegill fishing and, and hole hopping and, and, and kind of that, you know, when he was talking about targeting smallmouth in the same place he might target them in the fall up on a on a shallow sand flat. It's like, you know, that that would be something totally different for me. And, and I, it's enjoyable. I sit behind the scenes and look at some of these comments coming in, too. And and yeah, people cannot wait even more than than maybe a regular year to get out on the ice for 2020. So you've been uh, blessed with some awesome new products the last couple of years. Do you have a couple that have really been, uh, especially for the ice market, that have been really hot that just kind of blew you away as well by the acceptance in the market? You know, I think probably the Magna Bait Station is the item that really stands head and shoulders apart uh, in, in ice fishing. It, it's so innovative and, and it's so self-contained. You know, you've got no bubbler hanging on the side. Uh, you can really just manage that easily. And the beauty about that product is it works open water or ice fishing, right? It transitions between your boat and your shanty just easy and, and simple. So that's been great. 
Um, you know, some of the new Arc and Fire combos that we yep. introduced are a great new price point for people just getting started or if they just need a secondary rod. And then, um, you know, Framo also makes a great tackle bag and a great storage box to take your gear out on the ice. So all those things are some of my favorites. Um, and then if you go to Hub Shelters, our Fortress Shelter with those kickouts, um, you know, that really give you that extra space is a yeah. great, great item. Well, um, yeah, 50% if you more. I see that, it's, it's worth a, a second look for sure. You know, Kevin talked a little bit about the uh, Edge series, and I think that that rust proofing and that waterproof seal is actually more important on ice than it is in open water. I mean, bro, you've driven across a million miles of lakes, and you're you're throwing snow everywhere. Oh, uh, all over and, your stuff, yeah. And, and remember this: snow gets pulverized, and when it's not a snowflake anymore, it's dust, and it can creep into places. I've had where we didn't have the houses fast now with that strap in the beginning. And the inside, you couldn't even break it with your fist. It's just packed with uh, snow and super heavy. And the same will do, it'll get in your tackle boxes, but not the edges. So just, I just love them. And I know my stuff is going to be safe and that they're not going to get ruined. And I get, I get a lot of stuff with me because you never know. So Chris, I know you have some specials coming up for, uh, for this is Black Friday week or Thanksgiving week. And what are some of the specials that Frable is going to be running? Um, you know, we've got we've got some some markdowns on on a variety of gear um, on our website at Frayville.com. But but that main special, the one that you guys looked at earlier, um, you buy the I3 jacket and then you get the bibs at 50 percent off. Uh, that kicks off tonight. It's midnight Eastern time for any of you night owls that want to jump on that special ahead of time. <laughs> um, and then, you know, we're going to have some other specials, too, going across as we head toward. Thanksgiving, Cyber Monday, you know, it's, it's a big shopping weekend coming up. So uh, we most certainly have some great deals on our website directly. Can so. they buy a College of Ice mug? You know, uh, those are reserved for special <laughs> guests just like you. You know, the, the uh, only, only the big wigs, the hot, the hot shots get those. So, Or the guys that, that sign up and or, win the Fred Hill Prize Pack. Winners, yes. Yeah. Hey, uh, by the way, Stephen, bro, I personally packed up the first three winners and they shipped out. Uh, I would be shocked if they're not at their doorsteps uh, Monday or Tuesday of this coming week. So oh, that's, that's great. That's awesome. Great timing. So, yeah. well, yeah. Chris, hey, we appreciate you coming on tonight. And uh, we've got a couple more things I want to get to with bro. But uh, hey, have one, a great two night. Two quick things, Steve. I can't forget bro and Heather. Happy anniversary this week. Oh, I yeah. Give you a 20, shout out for that. 26 years. Forget. 26. Hi, Chris. I uh, know. Exciting. Congratulations. And and real quick before I go, um, Steve and bro, for the audience out there, you guys put in a ton of hours besides just this one hour every week. You know, you guys are on an hour early. You stay an hour late. You do a recap. There's a lot of behind the scenes work. And we just really appreciate all you're doing. You know, for the fans out there, you put a lot into these shows to make sure they're entertaining and they're educational. And uh, Frey Bill, we really appreciate that. You guys are working your butts off. Thank you very much for all that you're doing for us. Thank you. I, Thank I, you. I'll speak for myself, but bro, we're having fun, aren't we? Oh, this it's a great time. And I, I just like the stuff I'm hearing during the show. And I wish I could talk to everybody, but we'd never get it done. And, uh, and <laughs> after the show, I get to hear from everybody, but just a great time. And I get to hear what's going on around the U.S. We, and miss, we miss being on the road show, but we want we to. We miss the road show. show. But I don't want to be tied to it. I don't want to be, want to be the, bringing the wrong gift all over the place. So it's it's good to do this for right now. Yep. It, yep. It well, fun. I'll let you guys go. But uh, thanks a lot. Good work, gentlemen. Great, great show tonight. Thanks. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks again. Thanks, guys. Yeah. Hey, bro. Um, one of the things I wanted to get to tonight was jigging cadence. And we've got just seven minutes or so. So we're going to kind of hit this a little hard. But. Sure. I want to talk about jigging cadence through the season in terms of how do, how aggressive are you fishing for, say, walleye? What are some of your favorite jigging cadences? And then maybe how do you adjust it based on what you're seeing uh, while you're fishing? Well, I always start out, I, I, I give it a good rip when I'm, when I'm fishing walleyes to, to get that buckshot moving around. And, you know, it depends. If you're using something that tumbles a lot, this is what I'm, I'm always putting on. I have that at least on one rod <clears throat> rip and then, then let it, let it come back down. And then it's a matter of just making a shimmy, but there's other spoons that tumble. The buckshot flutter spoon will go off to the side. Uh, you could draw and fish, but as, as we start out right now, the reason everybody's excited to get on the ice is the walleyes are biting. And sometimes you can catch them all day. So 
that's why everybody wants to get out there. And so you could, you could jig aggressive. And I remember fishing with the Grizz. That guy jigs so hard. I can't believe he, his bait stays on the hook. He rips it. And then he's still catching fish in Mille Lacs. You know, so it's, it's rip jig and a work. But I, I like to do one good rip and then let it come in. And I watch the fish in my aqua view. They'll come in and they'll, 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 they'll nose the spoon and then back up, swim away, and come back through on Leech or Winnie. Even Lake of the Woods, you know, you could see fish uh, up there also. But so the, the cadences are going to change. Now, in Lake of the Woods, it's more subtle. Just like when you're at Winnipeg, you could rip it and it just disappears from them because you can't see. Red Lake, just a steady, steady retrieve. And as, as winter progresses, you still do that first good sweep and you're getting that jig to, to, to draw them in. Because if you're fishing weed beds, you know, let, let's say you're on Leech Lake and there's large miles and miles of weeds. How do you get their attention? They can't see through objects. They can feel it. They hear the vibration. But when you lift it up real high and let it drop in, it, it brings their attention. And as they come in, it, a lot of times the walleyes will come back two or three times and they strike it. And unless you're probably on the Great Lakes or something when it freezes, they just come in and eat it. But uh I, so, I've never told you this story, but I was I was sight fishing for walleyes on leech in February. I was in about nine feet of water working some of the flats. And and this was before Aquaview. This was before really sonar was using. And I had I had a, two rods rigged up. I had one with a tail hooked live minnow, and I had another a spoon with just a minnow head on it. And these two walleyes came in on a on a spoon with the with the with the I had the minnow down at the time and I was jigging it and they 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 sat there just like this and this is my jig and this is the, the two fish and I just kind of shake it a little bit all of a sudden I gave it a hop and both fish you could see their fins it was like they were electrocuted they got they 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 got all excited so I jigged it again it came up one of the fish came up and grabbed it set the hook reeled them up threw them in the back of the fish house. I looked down and the second fish is still there. So I grab, I have the rod in one hand. I have the other rod. I open the bail, it flutters down. And as I drop it, I pick up the rod, close the jig and that other fish grabbed it. And I caught two in a row, I opened it. I opened the fish house and went, I'm good. <laughs> I'm really good. <laughs> that was kind of fun. But it is fun when you can actually watch them on Aquaview and or sight fish them just directly. Uh, it's amazing how much you've learned in terms of your, your presentation. Absolutely, uh, you can you can see. I would you, you wouldn't know because sometimes these fish are four feet away, sometimes they're eight feet away, and you trigger them, they come in and hit. And even though you might not catch any more fish out of that hole, you got a fish there. You go to the next hole because you're fishing in six feet of water, eight, ten feet of water. So you're moving around. Of course, the morning and evening, uh, as as we say on Leech Lake, the hour of power. Uh, you know, right before dark, it doesn't matter what you do. They, you just catch them. But, uh, you know, you get on like one of a gosh, or, um, if you, you know, you, it's, it's, it's going to change a little bit. You got to stay, you got to stay in one spot and bring them in. Remember on, on humps and structure facing the large open areas as, as the shoreline connected points in breaks slow down towards the end of December, January, the humps turn on on all these lakes and yeah, are yeah. and it's, it's structures that aren't just a sandbar they got a little rocks here they got a little bit of weeds and the fish are going to work edges and there are spot on the spot spots did i just say that uh where you could catch walleyes every single night in the mitigating factors it's steep breaks structure with rocks weeds facing large open basins on the lake for me is is my tried and true Hey, uh, bro, we're running out of time. We got a minute left here. I, I did want to talk about that. Right immediately following the show, we're going to select the winner. We're going to stay live here, but we're going to shut down for a second so we can powwow about who's going to be selected from all the questions and things tonight. Uh, and we'll announce it here in just a few minutes immediately following. So this is the $165. Kai, bring up the photo of the uh, prize pack for Freyville so everybody knows what they can win tonight. Uh, which would be awesome. And then, uh, whoa, that's a cool graphic. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah. Yes. So you get, you know, you, you win a reel, a tip up, a tackle bag, and uh, look at the mugs and all that stuff and, and the, the safety kit and the edge box. So 
Uh, I, we're going to give one of these away, and then we're going to give one away every week. So everybody that tunes in has a chance, but we need you to get involved and comment and, and uh, ask questions. So that would be awesome. Hey, bro, we got a really cool show coming up Wednesday. This Wednesday, the day before Thanksgiving, we're going to talk about successful approaches to first ice. We're going to talk about safe travel. Um, you know, things like we keep harping on safety, but, you know, we've been through the ice and we don't want anybody to go through. So we're going to talk about it. And then we're going to have a gift guide set up. So if you're looking for gift ideas for the angler in your life, or if you want to drop some hints for the uh, spouse or, or others in your life, uh, let us know or check us in. We're going to have that. But we're going to have Jeremy uh, Rowe. He's a Freebill Pro. Coming on board, we've got Omnia Fishing, Brad Novak. Brad was on a few weeks ago and uh, awesome guest. So we're going to bring him on, back on board. And we're going to talk to Corey Francisco up at Marine General in Duluth, Minnesota. And we're going to talk about some of these uh, Great Lakes fish like lake trout and uh, and uh, steelhead and that sort of thing. So it's, it's very cool. But, hey, um, on behalf of myself and bro, Thank you, everybody that tuned in tonight. Thank you for the great questions, the comments. Uh, it's so exciting and fun to have everybody involved here. And I, I, I know you agree, bro. Yeah, I, I love it. And, you know, I'm just chomping at the bit like everybody else. But don't take any chances. Be safe. And there's plenty of winter. That's awesome. Everybody, thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock Central. Thanks for watching this week's College of Ice. Stay tuned for all new episodes coming up. Hey, bro, uh, we've got a winner tonight. Do you want to share the news? Yes, uh, we have a winner, and it is Daryl Ekstrom. Daryl, you're the winner, and you're from, like, the Carver, Minnesota area, and congratulations on winning the prize package. Hey, uh, Daryl, we really appreciate it. What we need you to do is, is private message us your shipping address. We'll pass it on to Fraybill, and they will send it directly for uh, from the factory to you. So uh, thanks for joining in. And everybody, thanks again. We really appreciate uh, having you guys uh, on board. And, bro, have a good next couple days. I'm going to be cutting up venison and hanging some horns, man. It was a better uh, good, it's been a good fall. I'm going to be looking for ice, and I might swat some chickens out of the air. Some yeah, of, yeah. So. That's awesome. Okay. All right. You guys, you're going to win next time. Keep trying. I appreciate it. Thank you. All righty. Everybody, have a great night. We'll see you on Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. Bye. Safe. Thanks for watching this week's College of Ice. Stay tuned for all new episodes coming up.